first introduction. Yeah, so this is uh, um, this is going to be like one of my first kind of practice uh, job talks. So in addition if, to just scientific questions, if you just have um, any sort of general question, uh, questions or comments on good things to, to put in or leave out or things to focus on or not focus on, any sort of feedback whatsoever would be um, really appreciated. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so um, today I want to talk about, sorry, it's a, uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, so today I want to talk about um, is work which I started as a working on as a PhD student, um, doing laying the theoretical groundwork, um, and as a postdoc, um, one of the things which I did a lot of work on um, with a lot of observers actually going ahead and testing and validating a lot of the ideas I originally laid out as a graduate student while as a uh, working under Professor Don Lai. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking today um, in general is how um, if you have a protoplanetary disk and a, a binary star system, how itty bitty small warps or tilts can actually play a really big role in determining how the protoplanetary disk goes ahead um, and evolves over uh, the system's lifetime. And so I like, like I um, have here in the bottom hand, uh, bottom panel, I, I did this work with a lot of different folks um, at CETA, um, and other institutes um, as well all across the United States and world in the world. But in particular, one of the uh, collaborators who did like an outsized amount of work um, is Michael Thune, who was an undergraduate um, when I did um, a lot of this work and is now a graduate student actually at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm not sure if there's uh, any faculty here who are uh, looking for uh, bright graduate students to, um, to carry out any of the really hard technical works that they have kind of bouncing around their head. But if you want a really good um, graduate student, I'd highly recommend you try and um, hire Michael Poon, who just got here, because he's done um, not just this work, he's done a lot of really great uh, work on a number of very different topics that are very difficult. Okay, um, so before I go into my own work, though, I want to talk about the theoretical background, which led, um, which uh, is motivating um, the, um, the field right now. And so, um, so before I, uh, well, actually a little bit after I did my work on understanding what happens when you have small tilts in, in protoplanetary disks, there's been a lot of detections of really, really large warps within uh, protoplanetary disk systems. And so um, the way that people have been inferring a uh, very uh, large work, warps within protoplanetary disks, it, uh, the, these inferences are primarily um, from ALMA. ALMA has completely revolutionized this, the field of protoplanetary disk astrophysics. And one of the key ways in which you infer the presence of very um, high warps is shadows. And so if you have um, a highly inclined disk with respect to the outer disk, it turns out the shadows cast um, uh, by the inner disk on the outer disk, uh, leave to a very telltale kind of asymmetric pattern um, on the outer disk's uh, scattered light emission. And, our, and the first uh, highly warped protoplanetary disk which was detected through this uh, way was HD 142527 by Marino et al. in 2015. So this was done when Marino with, uh, um, uh, Stefan Marino was a graduate student at Cambridge. And I remember when his work came out, I thought, this idea was just completely bananas, um, that, that you could have such a highly tilted protoplanetary disk. But it turns out after he did like this really incredibly pioneering work, there was a huge slew of additional um, highly tilted protoplanetary disks which were subsequently detected. Um, and we're using his kind of idea um, uh, for how you infer the presence of these high tilts um, from these, these, the scattered light emission. And so here's a very incomplete uh, sample of the number of uh, highly warped disks which were inferred by scattered um, light cast on the outer disk by the inner disk. Um, in addition to this kind of indirect way of inferring the presence of highly warped disks, you can also do it directly. And the reason why you can do it directly um, is because protoplanetary disks are composed of gas um, and gas um, have uh, a bunch of uh, different, uh, uh, have carbon dioxide um, within them. And the, the CO emits um, isotopologs at certain frequencies, which becomes red shifted as the gas is moving away from you and blue shifted as the gas is moving towards you. 
And by assuming that the gas, um, uh, it follows a, a circular Keplerian ellipse, you can go ahead and you can model the inclination of the disk as a function of distance from the host star to trace out the inclination um, of the, the, the disk itself. Um, and so what I'm showing here um, is a really nice uh, example, which was a really big discovery of GW Ori, which is this uh, proplanetary disk and triple star system, which you can see has a very, very big warp of the inner disk with respect to the outer disk. Um, in addition uh, to uh, uh, gas kinematics, you can also trace um, warps as a function of radius by looking at the continuum emission of proplanetary disks. So what I'm showing here is a specific example where um, folks were very lucky and were able to observe a, a very young protoplanetary disk um, at a nearly edge on orientation because um, when you're looking at the continuum emission, you're looking at the dust, which uh, settles to the midplane of protoplanetary disks. Um, by tracing how the midplane of the protoplanetary disk um, uh, changes as you move away from the host star, you can actually trace the warp of the protoplanetary disk itself. And so this um, particular protoplanetary disk, um, Sakai, along with a number of other authors, were able to um, infer a very small warp within um, the protoplanetary disk. In addition um, to uh, tracing small warps, you can also um, trace large tilts within protoplanetary disks also through continuum emission by fitting Gaussian uh, or rings to the continuum emission um, from the disk. And so because if a disk is tilted, it'll look a little bit more elongated. You can directly constrain the orientation of a, pro of a protoplanetary disk with respect to your line of sight uh, by fitting one of these Gaussian ellipses to uh, the continuum emission. So what I'm showing here is a really incredible work, work uh, done by Logan Francis and Ninke Vandermeer in 2020, where they did this uh, to a huge uh, number of transition disks by um, using ALMA to resolve the inner disk with respect to the outer disk of a number of transition disk systems. And one of the really surprising results which came out of this study was out of the 14 disks which they were able to resolve um, continuum emission from, um, eight of the 14 disks were consistent with very high misalignments of the inner disk with respect to the outer disk. Um, and so, um, so now we know, so when I was a graduate student, um, a lot of these observations uh, haven't become available um, yet. Um, but now it's becoming incredibly clear um, that, that not only uh, do there exist um, warped protoplanetary disks in uh, nature, very highly inclined uh, protoplanetary disks are incredibly common. However, um, it's so th th what I am personally interested in are the effects of very small warps. And it doesn't really seem like a very small warp in a proplanetary disk will affect much of anything. Um, but that's what I did uh, was, was the primary focus of my PhD um, thesis. And it turns out, um, even though it's really hard to detect very small warps within protoplanetary disks, they can actually have a very, very big impact on the long-term evolution of a protoplanetary disk system. And to understand exactly why a very small warp can have a very big impact on the dynamics of protoplanetary disks, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make an analogy. And the analogy um, which I'm gonna make is um, something I started doing research um, at the University of Toronto here at, at, with under the supervision of Professor Yanjin Wu, looking at tidal dissipation um, in uh, different bodies like stars and planets. And so the analogy um, with tides is that if you have a fluid body at the center of your system, which is an imperturbed by some perturber, to leading order, um, when there's no dissipation, uh, the tidal bulge is gonna exactly follow the location of the perturber as the perturber uh, orbits around the host. And when your uh, dissipation is very um, small, um, you can neglect um, any sort of difference in the location of the bulge and the location of the perturber and assume that the bulge uh, exactly follows the location of the perturber. However, um, no uh, fluid body uh, has absolutely no dissipation. Every fluid body has a little bit of sloshing going, along, uh, going on, which, uh, uh, which dissipates some amount of energy. And the main effect of uh, these different uh, complicated sloshing motions is to cause the bulge to have a very small lag behind the location of the turbine. And this very small lag behind the location of the perturber exerts a back reaction torque on a fluid body um, from the perturber. Um, and this back reaction torque works to drive the rotational evolution of the fluid body, as well as the orbital evolution of um, the perturber. 
And so, um, so, so this is the analogy uh, which I'm going to draw with titles of patient. It turns out the reason why small warps have a big influence on protoplanet digests are, are for very, very similar reasons. And so, it turns out um, if you have something kind of tilting a protoplanetary disk very gently, um, uh, far away from the protoplanetary disks, to leading order, the disk behaves very, very close to um, like a flat plate. And the reason why it behaves very close to a flat plate is because if you um, tilt the disk even a little bit, um, these things called bending waves, which I'm showing here, which are Athena++ simulations of, um, propagate across the protoplanetary disk. So pro bending waves are these, are, are these fluid disturbances which are sheared along the midplane and propagate across the disk at half the sound speed. And the main effect of these bending waves is to make sure the disk uh, doesn't become highly warped um, due to something going ahead and tilting it. And the result of this very efficient communication of bending waves is that if, you're, uh, if your disk is being perturbed externally, it's going to behave like a rigid plate's um, leading order to a very, very good approximation, except instead of, um, uh, in, um, instead of uh, like a test particle, when you're looking at the dynamics of a test particle, you have a single centimeter axis, you have to take an average over the entire annular extent of the disk. However, um, no a protoplanetary disk is completely flat. And the reason why no protoplanetary disk is completely flat is because every protoplanetary disk has a small amount of dis viscous dissipation. And this small amount of viscous dissipation causes a uh, warp to develop within the disk, um, causing a small um, twist um, within uh, the disk's annular extents. And the main dynamical effect of this small twist is to drive the long-term um, evolution of the protoplanetary disk uh, system uh, working to uh, drive the inclination evolution of protoplanetary disks over very, very, very long time scales. And so um, what I uh, worked on with Dong uh, to figure out is what are the consequences of these itty bitty tiny warps um, when you have a protoplanetary disk in a stellar binary system. And so um, with Dong, we primarily focused on two situations where you have a protoplanetary disk um, in some sort of binary uh, star system. The first is where the protoplanetary disk orbits two eccentric binary stars. So these are called circumbinary protoplanetary disks. And the second is a protoplanetary disk orbiting a single star with an inclined binary companion. Um, and so these protoplanetary disks are called circumstellar disks. And we're going to call the binary companion um, often just with short, uh, often with the shorthand, just uh, a companion. And so we're going to first talk about uh, the results of uh, circumbinary disk dynamics. Um, and so the motivation for why we're looking at circumbinary disks in particular um, is as if you constrain the inclinations of circumbinary disks using the methods I talked about in the beginning of the talk. It turns out the inclinations of most uh, circumbinary disks are very close to coplanar with respect to the inner binary orbital plane. Um, and uh, uh, and, and uh, by and large, the vast majority of circumbinary disks have very low inclination with respect to the inner binary orbital plane. However, um, when there are a number of very notable systems which have very high inclinations with respect to the inner binary orbital plane. In particular, um, one of the very interesting systems which is discovered um, very early on is the debris system 99 Hercules, which has a 90 degree inclination of the disk with respect to the inner binary um, orbital plane. And the system 99 Hercules motivated the work uh, by Rebecca Martin and Stephen Lubo um, to look at what happens when you have a protoplanetary disk around two eccentric binary stars. And it turns out if you have the protoplanetary disk around uh, two eccentric binary stars, which the simulations of Rebecca Martin and Stephen Lubo found, found out, is that the mutual disk binary inclination can be driven to a 90 degree orientation if the disk uh, starts off sufficiently inclined with the eccentric binary orbital plane. Um, and so um, this was a really surprising result. Um, and what I wanted to do um, in collaboration with Dong is I wanted to figure out that because this was a specific uh, simulation looking at a specific binary eccentricity, the eccentricity of 0.5 and an inclination, initial inclination of the disk with respect to the binaries over a plane of 60 degrees, I wanted to figure out a general set of conditions to figure out when a protoplanetary disk will core align with respect to the inner binaries over a plane. So this is what I did um, in collaboration with Dong. So the system, which I'm going to be talking about um, in a bit, is shown here, where at the center of the system, you have an eccentric binary star um, surrounded by a protoplanetary disk. 
Um, and the eccentric binary star has an orbital angular momentum unit vector, which we're going to denote by L hat to B. Um, and it has an eccentricity vector, which has a magnitude of the eccentricity and points in the pericenter direction of the eccentric binary, which we're going to denote by E sub B. And orbiting the circumbinary disk, we have a protoplanetary disk um, which uh, not only changes with time, but also can have uh, different inclinations of the inner disk with respect to the outer disk. And so, like I mentioned before, um, to leading order, you can treat the, a protoplanetary disk like a test particle or a rigid plate. It turns out um, the dynamics of a test particle around two eccentric binary stars has worked, worked out uh, pretty long ago now um, by Fargo and Lascar in 2010. And it turns out the dynamics of a test particle uh, boil down to a single dimensionless parameter, which is related to the total um, energy of the system, which is shown here in the bottom left-hand panel. And when this dimensionless parameter is positive, uh, the test particle has an orbital angular momentum unit vector close to the binary's orbital angular unit vector. And the dynamics of the system, what the system wants to go ahead and do is it just wants to recess around the binary's orbital angular momentum unit vector. However, when this dimensionless parameter is negative, um, instead of processing around the binary's orbital angular momentum vector, it instead processes around the binary's eccentricity vector. And this latter um, dynamical state is going to turn out to be very important for figuring out whether or not uh, disks uh, align or don't align. So I, uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? It's totally cool if there wasn't, but uh, I, I think I might have heard someone try and speak up and ask a question. Um, yeah, and feel free to ask questions or make comments at any time uh, during the talk. Okay, all right, so we'll keep on moving on. Okay, um, so that's the dynamics of a test particle around a two eccentric binary stars. Um, so what the, the main new thing, which I did in collaboration with Don, is I looked at what happens when you encode a uh, uh, viscous uh, disk warping from viscosity. And so it turns out, um, so what we went ahead and did is we calculated the back direction torque on the disk from the eccentric binary uh, due to the very small but non-zero uh, twist within the disk due to this disk small non-zero viscosity. Um, and it turns out, depending on the initial value of this dimensionless parameter lambda, what the disk goes ahead and does over very long time scales is one of two things. When the dimensionless parameter lambda starts off positive, what the disk goes ahead and does is it either aligns or counterlines with respect to the inner binary orbital plane. And this explains the vast majority of circuit binary disks, which are nearly aligned with the inner binary orbital plane. But when the initial lambda parameter starts off negative, what the disk instead goes ahead and does is, is instead of uh, just alignment, it does polar, it goes into a polar line state where the disk orbital anchor momentum unit vector becomes aligned with the binary's eccentricity vector um, in the direction of the binary's uh, pericenter direction. And so um, this is a very specific direction, a prediction for the orientation of a polar line disk. And the, con this, uh, the primary, con uh, suffi the sufficient condition for a disk to end up in one of these polar line states it's, is the initial disk binary inclination starts off with the inclination larger than the critical inclination um, shown here. And if you calculate this value for eccentricity of say 0.8, it turns out this critical inclination is about 20 degrees. And so it should um, not actually be hard to get a lot of polar aligned protoplanetary disks uh, to actually be seen in nature. And so we, one of the things we notice is, hey, this should actually be a pretty easy um, way to get really high inclinations of protoplanetary disks. And it turns out, um, after we published this work, there was a large amount of additional detections of highly inclined protoplanetary disks around eccentric binaries. And one of the really um, telltale protoplanetary disks, which it's really hard to explain um, from any other mechanism other than polar alignment, is this protoplanetary disk in HD 98800, um, which I like to call the smoking gun for polar alignments. Um, and so um, using the, um, the kinematic methods, which I discussed earlier in the talk, they were able to constrain not only the inclination of this protoplanetary disk with respect to the inner binary ori um, orbital plane, but also the orientation of this protoplanetary disk. And from their analysis, what they're able to find is that this protoplanetary disk um, is not only at a 90 degree inclination with respect to the inner binary's orbital plane, but its orbital anger momentum unit vector is almost exactly in the same direction um, as the binary's pericenter direction. Um, and it's, it's actually incredibly difficult to explain how this uh, system formed in this very, very particular orientation with any other um, mechanism other than polar alignment. JJ, quick oh, yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Can you go back one slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you mentioned something about a critical angle of 20 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where does this appear in your plots? I'm I'm, yeah. I'm seeing that there's the separatrix. Mm -hmm. That looks like uh, something like 60 degrees or... Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah. So great, great question, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, so the reason why this critical inclination is 60 degrees rather than um, 20 degrees, like I mentioned uh, earlier, is because the binary eccentricity is 0.3. Mm -hmm. um, so this critical, what this critical inclination is in terms of physics is the lower edge of the separatrix. Um, so if you draw kind of a line um, uh, at the bottom edge of the separatrix, um, it, that is the critical inclination uh, shown here. Yeah. And it depends on the binary eccentricity. And so I'm plotting here the binary eccentricity of 0.3, but there are a lot of circumbinary disks which have very large um, eccentricity, uh, which orbits binaries with very large eccentricity. In particular, this um, protoplanetary disk orbits a binary with eccentricity of around 0.8. If you calculate this critical inclination, the inclination which a protoplanetary disk needs to start above in order to pull a line, the critical inclination turns out to be about 20 degrees. Um, and so it does it does depend on the binary eccentricity. Um, but so, it, so you yeah. have a clear prediction here. This yes. is that, yeah. that and, yeah. and OK, you're going to discuss yeah, yeah. So the, the clear prediction, um, yeah. So I had a very clear prediction. It, binaries above this critical inclination can pull or align. It becomes easier with increasing binary eccentricity. Here's a specific example of one of these systems actually seen in nature, which was uh, discovered after we made the prediction. In addition um, to this one, it's, there's been a really nice work by Ian Chekola along with Eugene Chang, um, who were uh, at, at University of California, Berkeley at the time. Ian Chekla um, is now at um, Penn State. Um, he's a professor there. Um, and what they were able to show is that this also checks out statistically. So if you look at the statistics of both planets around uh, two eccentric binaries, as well as protoplanetary disks around two eccentric binaries, you, you find that disks around more eccentric uh, binaries have higher inclinations. In particular, um, so Ian did a lot of detailed work. So it turns out um, when you have a low inclination of the disk with respect to the binary, there's a lot of degeneracies that can pop up that make it so that it's not exactly clear if your um, inclination is actually very small. But Ian did a lot of really intense uh, Bayesian statistics to show that actually this is real. If you have a low binary eccentricity, your preference for near zero inclinations is a real, is a real physical effect. Um, this one, they didn't actually say, but I'm going to put uh, words into um, Ian's mouth. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, that's, um, so there's a number of systems which have been detected now um, that um, when at very large eccentricities, um, which have at least one uh, solution, which is consistent with polar alignment. And so when you get high eccentricities, there does seem to be this nearly bimodal um, distribution of binaries with either near zero inclinations when the, inc when the binary eccentricity is low and nearly 90 degree inclinations when the binary eccentricity is high. But there are a few um, systems which don't fit into this very nice dynamical figure, uh, picture which I laid out. In particular, um, one of the systems which doesn't um, fit into this nice, nice, nice neat dynamical picture, uh, Michael Poon, the graduate student who is um, the now graduate student at the University of Toronto did a lot of really uh, great detailed work uh, to constrain the inclination of. And so specifically- yeah, questions are Peter uh, issue. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. I wasn't paying attention to the, yeah, yeah. Feel free, Peter, to um, jump in. Yeah. Well, this isn't necessarily the right time for this question, but uh, <clears throat> you, you're telling us the end state uh, if it starts at 20 degrees or more etc. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what does any of this tell you about why the initial state was at a certain uh, inclination? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really, really great question. Um, so you're absolutely right that something has to explain why these circumbinary disks start off with a non-zero um, inclination. And so it turns out the um, theoretically, um, although this has yet to be a uh, uh, confirmed um, observationally. I'm actually, I, I don't, I was going to add this uh, slide in, but I didn't have time last night to, to include it. Eric Jensen is actually trying to constrain uh, the mutual um, inclinations of circumstellar disks and binary star systems. Um, and uh, so theoretically, you expect a non-zero inclination of the disk with respect to inner binary uh, because these systems form in turbulent molecular clouds. And so 
Um, what's happening when these systems are forming, they're not uh, forming in these nice, neat, ordered system. They, they, they form in these giant turbulent molecular clouds. And when they form in the first place, what happens is a, a, a disk of uh, gas and dust goes ahead and gravitationally collapses. Um, and if angular momentum were perfectly conserved and there was no turbulence, you'd expect um, that the circuit binary disk to have exactly the same inclination as the inner binary circle plane. Um, but if you actually go ahead and you do the simulations, uh, in particular, Matthew Bate has been working on this, this topic, I think for like two decades now. Um, and the, his really detailed SPH calculations, what they find is that it's really common to actually have both um, a circumstellar disks with a binary companion, as well as circumbinary disks orbiting two, uh, two binary stars to start off with a significant non-zero inclination. Uh, does that answer your question, Peter? Do you want uh, more details or? No, no, that, that's uh, uh, a great uh, <clears throat> explanation into a fascinating area for future research, I guess, because yeah. we really want to know where it all comes from, <laughs> how yeah. it gets into this final state. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and I totally agree. And there's actually a lot of um, observers who are trying to figure out this question actually right now at the current moment. Um, they just uh, they just need observing time. So please, if there's any um, folks on the observing committees, please give folks like Eric Jensen time to figure out if um, the inclinations of uh, disks around uh, different stars. Um, yeah, okay. All right, um, any other questions or comments? Happy, I love questions. If anyone else has questions, please uh, go ahead and speak up. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna keep on uh, marching on. Okay, um, so uh, what Michael Poon did is he investigated the system known as KH15D. Um, so this is a very particular um, warped disk, which was, which was inferred indirectly um, in the late 90s and early um, aughts um, uh, through the, these very strange uh, periodicities in these the centric binaries um, light curve. And so, if you look at this eccentric binary um, over uh, periods of around tens of days, it had very periodic variations in the system's light curve, um, and it's like very, very uh, predictable and periodic variations in the system's light curves over periods of tens of days. But if you looked at the system over decade-long time scales, what happened is the amount of flux variations of the systems very, very slowly and gradually changed with time. And people for a long time didn't exactly know what was going on in the system um, until um, actually at basically the same time, both uh, Eugene Chang and Ruth Murray Clay at Berkeley, well, Josh uh, Wynn, who was at MIT at the time, um, they, they both came out with an explanation um, at the same time for the physical reason why you're seeing these uh, quasi-periodic oscillations in the protoplanetary disk system. And so it turns out what's happening is you have these two eccentric binary stars, and um, they're being occulted by a uh, warped and slowly processing uh, protoplanetary disk. And over the short, roughly uh, tens of days uh, time scale, what you're seeing is the inner binaries uh, moving inside, um, uh, being occulted uh, by the disk um, and not occulted uh, over a period, which is the binary's orbital period. And over long time scales, the reason why you're seeing the slow variation in the slight curve is the disk itself is slowly processing into re with respect to your line of sight. Um, and so um, the really incredible work which uh, Michael did is he went ahead and fits a really detailed dynamical model um, to the 60 years worth of data that we have um, from the system. And he was actually able to constrain what we expect this disk uh, to look like. Um, which hadn't really been done before. So uh, Eugene Chang, um, his original paper gave a, a number of estimates, but he didn't have the full information which you need to be able to constrain it because um, when Eugene Chang did this original um, work, he only had information up to about uh, uh, 2002, um, which only gives you information on the leading edge, the first part of the disk, which is a Colting interbinary orbital plane. And since then, one of the dramatic predictions of this model is that the trailing edge of the disk should cause the system to bright, brighten up again, which was dramatically um, reaffirmed by um, Capello et al. in 2012. Um, and Michael did really detailed observational work using the fact that we have both um, the, 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 the light curve decreasing and then increasing with time to constrain the, the parameters of the circumbinary disk system. It's able to constrain the procession period of this disk to be around 600 years. 
Um, and he was able to figure out that the leading edge um, is the one, um, is the inner edge of the disk, which is slowly eclipsing the eccentric binary, with it, which has a radius rest less than about one AU, while the trailing edge has an outer radius of around a few AU. And one of the really surprising things, which actually isn't predicted by hydrodynamical theories for disk, is that we were able to find that the inner edge of the disk is actually more inclined than the outer edge of the disk. Um, and he was also able to actually directly constrain this small twist, which I mentioned before, which leads to the, in this situation, the disk aligning with respect to the binaries over the plane. And with this constraint, he was able to figure out that the disk itself should align in about a thousand years unless the inclination is excited by something. And so um, the fact that this thing is still processing, the fact that the inclination isn't really described well by uh, warped hydrodynamical theories, as well as the very rapid time scale for realignment, as well as the truncated outer radius of the disk, makes us predict that the system actually might have a planet exterior to the disk itself. Um, and it's also worth noting that although um, Eugene um, only had way less data than we did, um, the system parameters which we're able to infer from the system are very, very are actually very similar than to the ones which he originally proposed. Okay, so that's um, certain binary disks. Um, are there any additional questions or comments about this? Okay, all right. So I'll keep on marching on to, from circumbinary disks to circumstellar disks with uh, binary companions. And so the motivation for the second part is a little bit different um, than the motivation for the first part, where instead of um, actually observing protoplanetary disks, we're going to look at the result of protoplanetary disks, specifically um, the end formation of planets. And so there's um, this outstanding problem in dynamical exoplanetary astronomy where a number of uh, exoplanets have been detected with an orbital plane highly misaligned with respect to the, stellars, the star's equatorial plane. And, there, um, and the most prevalent, the, the most um, popular um, and convincing explanation by far um, was actually developed here at the University of Toronto by Yenshin Wu along with uh, Norm Murray. Um, who argue that the reason why um, one of the, the, the models for why you can end up with systems like this um, is do, that the planet basically had a bad day. So I like to call these theories planetary mosh pit theories because what happens is um, when the system kind of per, the per system first starts off forms nice or, and orderly and neat, but something in the system goes ahead and um, causes uh, the system to get scrambled up and dynamically excited. And so the two most popular theories are planet-planet scattering. So uh, two planets gravitation, uh, actually three planets gravitationally interact with one another, causing one of them to end up on a highly eccentric orbit and flying to the host star's equatorial plane. And the mechanism which Yenshin uh, Wu and Norm Murray proposed in 2003 was the lidov cosi mechanism from a, a inclined binary companion. And one of the big uh, predictions of this uh, set of theories, which I'm um, going to be calling the planetary mosh pit theories, is that um, these systems should only form late um, in the, um, these misaligned plants should form late um, in exoplanetary system lifetimes. In contrast, uh, the, the, the set of theories which I um, worked on with Dong to try and figure out if they can explain a number of these spin art misaligned exoplanetary systems is a set of theories known as primordial misalignments, where the misalignment between the uh, this, uh, the planet's orbital plane, the host star spin axis, occurs while the planet is still forming in its natal protoplanetary disk. Um, and the particular um, for scenario which I invested um, a lot of time uh, figuring out is when you have an inclined binary companion, which goes ahead and, and generates misalignment with respect to the host star spin axis and the planet's orbital plane. The key thing about these um, scenarios is that they predict that these misalignments should happen very early um, in the system evolution of uh, different exoplanetary systems. And so I'm going to be focusing now on the, the system setup uh, for the right um, most mechanism, the gravitational torque from the inclined binary companion. So this is the system setup, which we're going to be discussing um, in the second part of the talk. So at the center of the system, we have the, the host star, which is oblate because it's spinning. Um, which is being gravitationally torqued by a circumstellar disk with orbital incrementum unit vector L hat sub D. Um, and this circumstellar disk is being orbited by an inclined binary companion with orbital incrementum unit vector L hat sub B. There are two primary torques going on in the system. The first torque is exerted on the stellar spin axis, S hat, uh, by the circumstellar disk, causing this, this, the 
the spin of the star to recess around the disorbital incrementum unit vector. And the second torque is exerted on the circumstellar disk by the inclined binary companion, causing the disk to process around the binary's orbital plane. And the goal of the work which I set out um, with Dong was to figure out under what conditions you can generate misalignments between this host star spin axis and the disk's orbital incrementum unit vector. Okay. Um, so if you don't include um, planets, um, this is what happens to the system. So uh, because protoplanetary disks start form with a whole lot of mass um, initially, and mass uh, causes the stellar spin to process much more rapidly around the disorder of incrementum vector, the system starts off with the stellar spin axis very tightly coupled with respect to the disorbital incrementum unit vector. You can't really excite significant um, stellar obliquities within the system. However, um, as, as systems, uh, as protoplanetary disks evolve with time, the disk eventually loses mass, either through turbulent viscosity or disk winds or whatever your favorite mechanism to cause the disk uh, to lose mass. Um, and at some point, um, the disk loses so much mass um, that the star can no longer remain coupled to the circumstellar disk. And when the star is no longer coupled to the circumstellar disk, um, then you can generate significant misalignments of the star spin axis with respect to the disk, because both are just doing their own thing, um, uh, processing in their own way, because they're no longer coupled to one another. Um, and sometime in the middle of the system evolution, the system undergoes what's called a secular resonance. I don't have time to explain uh, the de technical details of this. The main effect of a secular resonance is to cause significant misalignments between the stellar spin axis and the disorbital incrementum unit vector. And so the key um, thing in order to generate misalignments through this mechanism, you just have to have a disk which loses mass. Because we know observationally um, all disks lose mass, it's incredibly easy to generate misalignments from this mechanism. All you need is binary, and there's tons of protoplanetary disks which are observed to have binary companions. And so um, so this mechanism was originally thought to be an incredibly robust and leading theory to generate um, spin orbit misalignments within exoplanetary systems. And what Dong wanted uh, me to, to try and figure out is if you add a planet to the system, what happens? So if you add a forming planet within the system, because that's what we want to observe anyway at the end of the system evolution, what happens to the dynamical evolution of, these, uh, of the system? And so it turns out the main effect of a planet is to exert additional torque on the host star, which is spinning at the very center, um, which affects how quickly the star processes around the disk and how well it's coupled to the circumstellar disk. And depending on how massive the planet is or how far away um, the planet is, you can have one or two, one of two situations. So the first situation is when the planet is really far away. And because when the planet is very far away, um, the, the torque exerted on the host star by the planet is negligible. Um, this, the planet doesn't really influence the system much at all. And you can still have significant stellar obliquities, which are exciting with the system, shown in the thin um, uh, blue line here. When the planet has a when the Jovian mass planet in this uh, situation has a distance of about 0.26 uh, AU. However, when the planet forms very, very close to the host star, what this planet kind of acts to do is act like this dam, dam to lock in some, ma some mass of the disk uh, because the planet uh, doesn't lose mass as the disk loses mass. Um, and the result of the planet forming very close to the star is the, the star, star remains tightly coupled to the planet's orbital plane, which is in also tightly coupled to the disk. And so when you form a close-in planet to the star, you actually can't generate primordial misalignments uh, through the inclined binary companion's gravitational torque. And so when we published this work, it actually was a really big buzzkill um, for this uh, way to generate stellar obliquities um, because um, if you form a short period massive planet, which is actually the majority of systems where we've detected spin orbit misalignments, you can't generate st significant stellar obliquities through this system. It, it, it throws a total wrench um, into this way of exciting spin orbit misalignments. And so specifically, um, if you have a multi, like an uh, exoplanetary system with the binary companions, uh, so what this work does is it makes, um, it, 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 on the one hand, it does make it more difficult to generate stellar obliquities. But on the other hand, it offers a way to actually test when this mechanism can actually operate in a exoplanetary system. Um, and so first off, um, so there are a number of different situations where you can test 
whether or not a close in planet um, can suppress or not suppress the excitation of cellular obliquities from the inclined binary companion if the inclined binary companion is what is causing stellar obliquities to be excited in the first place. So the first scenario is if you have a young um, massive planet, which it lies on a short orbital period, the reason, which has an observed binary companion. So the reason why this is, uh, it, um, so if the system's forms, of, if you see the system very young, because it hasn't had time to migrate inward through the planetary mosh pit theories, um, the best, the mo we can probably infer that the system for hasn't changed its um, planetary architecture since it formed in its natal part of the planetary disk. And so you predict that this system should have a very low stellar obliquity because the planet um, causes the star spin to remain tightly coupled to the disk. The second situation um, is if you have a multi-planet system which is dynamically cold, or in other words, um, a system of multiple planets with low mutual inclinations and low eccentricities. And because what I like to call the planetary mosh pit theories predict that uh, the system undergoes some sort of dynamical excitation in its lifetime, um, you don't have a um, dynamically cold system. The, the, the system itself is unlikely to have evolved its planetary architecture since it formed its natal protoplanetary disk. If you have the planets further enough away from the host star, you predict that these systems should be misaligned. And the last testable prediction um, is similar to the, the second one, except if you have a multi-planet system where the planets are very close to the host star. And this, is, this situation, again, because the architecture shouldn't have evolved since the planets form in the protoplanetary disk, again, you should predict that these the stellar spin should be very closely aligned with the, the planet's orbital plane. And so far, um, all the testable predictions, um, which we've made, we, have, we don't have statistical um, works to back this up yet because we're still dealing with very small numbers of systems. But at least at the present moment, we can point to specific systems which satisfy the predictions which um, Dong and I originally made um, in 2018. So before I talk about, um, in particular, um, I'm very proud of the second work because this was a, a work I did in collaboration um, with Simon Albright and a number of other uh, collaborators across the world, which was a direct, direct um, detection of a significant solar bookly excited within a multi-planetary system. Okay, so before I talk about the observational work, which led to these, um, these stellar spin orbit misalignments, which you can detect, I'm gonna talk about um, how you actually measure this stuff briefly. So the main way you actually detect non-zero stellar obliquities is through what's called the rossiter mclaughlin effect. Um, and so uh, the way you detect these non-zero stellar obliquities is you look at the radial velocity curve. And so you can, from the star spectrum, you can infer if the star is moving away from you or towards you by whether or not the spectral lines are red shifted or blue shifted. Um, this is usually the, a very common way to detect planets. But if in addition to this radial velocity information, you also have the planet transiting, it turns out you can get a whole lot information, more information about the system. And specifically, the new information which you can get um, is the direction the planet is orbiting with respect to the direction the star is spinning. So in addition to the planet causing the star to wobble, um, the fact that the star is spinning also uh, means that um, stuff moving towards you um, on the star is, is blue shifted because it's moving towards you and stuff uh, moving away from you on the star because the rotation is red shifted. And if the planet is orbiting the same direction as the host star, um, it first covers up uh, the blue shifted stuff, uh, making an anomalous red shift, and then later comes up with an anomalous red shift, uh, co co uh, covering up the red shifted stuff causing an anomalous blue shifted. And you have the, the exact opposite situation if the planet is orbiting in the opposite direction. And through this technique, you can actually test these different theories and measure the direction the star is spinning with respect to the direction the planet is orbiting. And so um, the first system, which uh, detected um, which detected a near zero obliquity, um, so I didn't work on this system, I'll just talk about it very briefly. <laughs> Um, it's in a very young uh, uh, open cluster, um, this DS uh, Tuck system, um, and it has, uh, which consists of a G star host with a, um, an, a K um, star companion, which has a projected separation of around uh, 240 AU. Um, and the planet, which is suppressing uh, spin orbit misalignments within the system, is a hot super Neptune, which has an orbital period of about eight days and a radius of around six Earth radii. And the prediction, which is actually verified by the observation, um, is that the stellar obliquity should be close to zero. So the work um, which I did um, in collaboration with Simon Albright 
um, is we tested whether or not the, the K2 to 90 planetary system um, has a significant stellar ability. And so this system consists of an F star host um, with a hot Neptune um, orbiting around the, 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 the host, um, which has a longer orbital period of around nine days. Um, and a, a further an, a, a exterior to this um, M dwarf uh, host, there is a warm Jupiter um, with an orbit period about uh, 60 days. Um, and so you, the, the work which I did predicted that this system should actually be possible to excite um, stellar obliquities within the system. And if, um, and, and I, I remember like uh, I talked to Simon at a conference in detail and we we're originally planning on uh, working on some small paper together. Um, and after the conference, I was just sitting in my office and I got an email from him. It, basically, the email was in all caps saying like, hey, we have to talk right now after I talked about um, how the, the work that I did um, with Dong, figuring out when you can excite solar obliquities. And the reason why he was so excited is he, did, is he measured uh, the, uh, the um, so, uh, roster McLaughlin effect for the uh, massive uh, planet C um, very far away from the host star. Through the Rosser and McLaughlin effect, he was able to find that almost certainly this planet is retrograde. Um, so the the dashed gray curve is what would, the the Rosser McLaughlin effect for a prograde planet, while the black curve is a Rosser McLaughlin effect for a retrograde planet. You could clearly see that um, a retrograde orbit fits it much better. And with a whole lot more information, Simon um, and Maria Forth, the graduate student who did the really groundbreaking work here was able to actually infer the true obliquity of the system, which has a true obliquity of about 125 degrees. And the primary thing which I did um, with in collaboration with him is I sh as I did a lot of simulations showing that it doesn't really matter what how far away the, the, um, the companion is. Um, there's a projected uh, separation. We don't actually know the true semi-major axis, but we have a projected uh, separation, so we have an idea. Um, but it doesn't really matter how far away it is because it, irrespective of how far away it is, as well as how inclined it is, um, the, this system can generate significant stellar obliquities through this primordial misalignment scenario where the gravitational torque excites significant stellar obliquities in the system. Okay, and so that concludes um, the talk and I'll take any uh, questions if you have them. Yeah, thanks, thanks again, um, everyone for coming to the talk. Um, Thank you so much, JJ. Um, so please raise your hand or unmute yourself for the questions. Norm. So JJ, I was trying to understand, I couldn't quite follow. Okay. Um, you said that you had this original explanation for how you got an inclined planet relative to the star. And then you said it was a buzzkill because it didn't work. Yeah. And then you said when you made predictions about when it should be inclined or not, that came out to be correct. Yeah. Yeah. So is the conclusion that the inclined planets are caused by this mechanism or is there some other mechanism that, that's at work that didn't interfere with your predictions or what's going on? Yeah, yeah, so sorry. It, yeah, now that I think about it, it's good to, to clear up that. So um, here, I'll, share, I'll go back to sharing the screen again. Um, yeah, so um, the prediction uh, from the work is that planets like this can't generate significant stellar, uh, stellar misalignment. So if you have a really big planet, which orbits at a very close distance to its host star, um, so so um, the reason why this was a buzzkill is the primary planetary systems where significant spin orbit misalignments were detected um, were uh, hot Jupiter systems, right? Um, and so that's, so it looks like uh, the leading theory to explain them right now is actually the, the mechanism which you and Yanshan Wu um, worked on, uh, which is the gravitational torque from inclined binary companion or a planet planet scattering, um, which Eric Ford and a lot of other folks have worked on. Um, and so, yeah, so the reason why that's true is because the close in planets will always, uh, if it's massive enough and close enough, its gravitational torque will always cause the spin to never become decoupled from the disk. It'll always remain coupled. The, the prediction from my work is that if instead you have a close in planet, you have a very far away planet, um, it's 
doesn't always have to remain coupled. The stars, the star spin can decouple at some point in the evolution because the planets are so far out. Um, the spin of the star can just do whatever it wants because the gravitational torque um, from the planets is so weak. Uh, JJ, yeah. this is where I also am getting confused. What's the yeah. quantitative uh, criterion dividing those two outcomes? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a that's an excellent question. I didn't have uh, a time in the, the talk to present it, so I can here. I have an additional slide, so I should I should keep that in the backup slides. Hold on a second. Here. Um, sorry. Yeah. So the the key prediction is the at some point in the evolution. The precession rate of the star around the planet has to be less than the precession rate of the planet around the disk. So um, pulling up, there's a different talk where I actually have this. I, I, I didn't have time to make backup slides. This is one of the backup slides I was originally planning on including. Um, here. So so the the concrete prediction um, is that at some point in the evolution, the precession rate of the star, um, which is driven by the planet's gravitational torque, has to be less than the precession rate of the disk driven by the inclined binary's torque. Um, and if you take typical parameters um, for uh, the radial extent of a protoplanetary disk, as well as the binary semimeter axis of protoplanetary disk systems, which have binary companions, um, this, the specific criterion which you get um, is planets uh, bigger than uh, about 0.24 for typical hot Jupiter systems, or for typical Jovian mass um, systems, cannot undergo, get significant stellar ubiquities excited by the system. And so as you can see, yeah, oh, Chris, you're, you're saying something. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm still, so star yeah. planet precession rate. Yes. Uh, precession of what, precisely about what? Yeah, so the precession of a stellar spin axis yes. around the planet's orbital angular momentum unit vector, which because the planet is still embedded within the disk, yeah. is also the disk's orbital angular momentum unit vector. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you say around the disk? Oh, so the, the disk has almost all the angular momentum at that point. Yeah. yeah, the yeah, point. yeah. Yes. So when you say it's the, it's the total, really it would be the precession around the total angular momentum vector, but the disk has all the angular momentum. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. So, so because of planet disk interactions, the the planet stays tightly embedded within the disk, um, and because the disk has all the angular momentum. And uh, 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 omega dB is the precession of the disk's angular momentum vector due to the quadrupolar field of the binary. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great questions. Um... Thank you. Uh, you're muted, Jensen. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm also um, didn't follow some part of it, but isn't yeah. so you're using the quadruple moment of the gravitational quadruple moment of the star due to the rotation? Mm -hmm. um, use that to sort of couple dynamically to the disk, to the planets, and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of on the weak side compared to any potential magnetic coupling if the star oh. is a rotating dipole? Yeah. Wouldn't that be much stronger on the magnitude? Um, you can actually estimate. Yeah, that's a great question. It turns out, um, yeah, so magnetic fields not only cause the stellar spin to align or, or actually counter align um, with respect to the direction the, the disk is orbiting, they can also affect the precession rates of the star yeah. with respect to the disk. Actually, um, it's, yeah. I have to, I have to dissent. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is Dong's uh, Dong has claimed uh, <laughs> yeah. that, but um, the reason why I dissent is that the star, if it has a dipole field, mm -hmm. almost certainly will have a much stronger internal toroidal field. Mm -hmm. And if it's in anywhere near co-rotation between its magnetosphere and the disk near the magnetospheric boundary, yeah. then you can show that the change in the non-spherical part of the rotational energy due to the triaxial or, or the prolate deformation of the star by the internal magnetic field mm -hmm. is much more important than the change in the external magnetic energy due to the, um, due to the uh, interaction with the disk. Mm -hmm. so, um, so in fact, um, 
the problem actually it's still an open i mean that's still something that needs further investigation yeah but, yeah uh, yeah, and so, so what you're arguing is that the toroidal field can actually modify the interaction? Well, what's interesting is that, you know, you suppose the toroidal field energy is comparable to the dipole field energy, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, when it's yeah. near co-rotation, then it's mm -hmm. not hard to see that the interaction energy of the magnetic field, the deformation of the magnetic energy due to the disk, mm -hmm. due to mm -hmm. the highly conducting disk, mm -hmm. that's comparable to the, you know, the uh, not off non-spherical part of the rotational energy tensor, right? Of the, you know, take the magnitude of those non-spherical pieces mm -hmm, mm -hmm. due to the presence of this internal magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but, you're, you're, oh, sorry. But when the magnetic energy dominates interior, as it probably does, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then in fact, that second term will be more important. So the, the point is that if the star is prolate, it wants to tip over, mm -hmm. okay? uh, the minimum energy state is one where it's tipped over. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay, huh. All right, well, yeah, yeah. So it's, I remember Dong's model in particular. So he, he, didn't, he didn't beat around the bush, uh, like just saying um, that he makes some really crude assumptions for his, how the stellar magnetic field goes ahead and interacts, interacts with the disk. Yeah, and so, so like you, you're mentioning, yeah, you're, you're talking about the conduction. So the the Don's model for the stellar magnetic field, it assumes that there is some part of the disk which is conducting, which doesn't allow the magnetic field to penetrate at all. There's also a part which is diffusive, and this diffusive part allow, is the, the primary one that either tips the, the star over or causes it to align with the disk. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's it's totally messy. He, yeah, it's, it's very unclear. I think folks are, like, Marina, like, recently actually did some really cool simulations looking in detail about the interaction. Um, I'm not sure if she made any kind of concrete results comparing Dong's model, but she was able to at least model the time evolution of the star spin um, due to the interact magnetic interaction of the star um, with the disk. Um, and I think it's still uh, pretty open, but um, going back to Yen Chen's specific question. So, so Dong's model, although very parameterized and very uncertain, um, it does allow you to estimate the, the magnitudes of different things. And if you estimate the magnitude of the precession rates, which is driven potentially by a disk, which is a little bit conducting, um, it turns out that precession rate is still quite a bit smaller than the precession rate driven um, by the star um, due to the disk. So I, I, I could actually, it might be a good idea to include um, that estimates um, uh, different torques. Mag versus um, gravitational, but um, if you do the um, if you do the work, um, it turns out the uh, the gravitational torque typically dominates over the ma magnetic torque. Um, uh, does that answer yeah. your question, Yanchen? Yeah, and Chris, yeah, I mean you're you know a lot more about magnetic fields than I do, so if you disagree with anything I say, yeah, feel free to jump in. All right, I think we have time for one more question to ask. All right, if not, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.